so to kick off our discussion and frame the strategic environment, delighted to introduce to the stage um, Michelle Flournoy. Um, Michelle is the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors, uh, co-founder and former chief executive officer and now chair of the Center for New American Security in Washington. She served as the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, from 2009 to 2012, where she was principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense in the formulation of national security defense policy, oversight of military plans and operations, uh, and uh, participant in National Security Council deliberations. She's a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, a distinguished professor at the um, uh, Tech uh, Georgia Tech's Nunn School of International Affairs, um, a member of the Council of Relations and Aspen Strategy Group, which means, means we get to hang out for a week at Aspen every summer, which is awesome, um, and a member of the very important um, uh, Defense Policy Board, which advises the Secretary of Defense on uh, strategic and operational questions. So I'm going to invite Michelle to give us some open remarks. We'll have a brief discussion, and then I will invite uh, other panelists up. But please uh, welcome to the stage Michelle Flournoy. Thank you, Mike. It's uh, wonderful to be here back in Australia after COVID and everything else and broken ankle and too many other things that kept me away. Um, but just kudos to you also and the USC for convening this conversation at this moment. I think it's such an important for, time for us to come together and grapple with some of these issues. So, you know, if you, I think if you project forward 20, 30 years from now and you look back at this period we're in now, I think we will recognize that we are are in a geostrategic inflection point. Um, the, the sort of globalization, uh, economic integration that defined the last several decades is really shifting in a different direction towards a much more disintegrating and multipolar world. And when I say that, I don't mean multipolar defined blocks, but more of a, a, a disentangling of some uh, aspects of our economic and security relations and um, a sort of clustering of countries with a number of countries sort of being swing states, changing their alignments uh, and their affinities depending on the issues at hand. And so if we look at this, you know, what's, what's driving this? I think there are several factors. Um, the first is a real change in China, um, the rise of a China that is now much more assertive, even aggressive in some areas. And you know, for so long, we, at least US policy, was really focused on integrating China into um, the global uh, order. Uh, we sponsored China into the WTO. We engaged with them, trying to get them to be a responsible stakeholder, to buy in to the international order and to shape it as a stakeholder at the table. But with the advent of President Xi, um, the direction really changed. You know, the hide and bide strategy was put aside, the veil dropped, and she is now taking a much more assertive, again, sometimes aggressive stance to sort of assert China's role um, not only in the region but globally, and to uh, do so sometimes trying to unilaterally change the status quo, um, not abiding by international law. So that is, I think, one of the principal drivers. But we're also seeing other powers contribute to this sense of disintegration. Um, obviously, uh, Putin's, Pu uh, President Putin of Russia, this, Russia is now a revisionist power, de declining by many objective measures, economically, demographically, mili even militarily, I think, as we've seen. Um, but Putin still is set on an expansionist vision, reestablishing a sphere of influence. And in the process, he's sort of torpedoed the vision of Europe whole, free, and at peace that we thought we had achieved after the Cold War. And then you have the just the sort of dogged persistence of powers like Iran, North Korea, and others who just have never bought into the international order and continue to challenge it in many ways. So in that environment, um, one of the most problematic elements is that we have some very serious trans transnational threats to deal with collectively. The existential threat of climate change. Um, Post-COVID, you know, the, the, the realization that global pandemics can actually happen and they're very problematic and dangerous for us and they cost lives. How do we prevent those future pandemics? Um, continued concerns about proliferation of weapons of mass destruction 
production, which is only going to become more serious with the advent of both AI and synthetic biology. Um, and then the persistence, what we're seeing in the Middle East right now, the persistence of violent extremism and terrorism. And so these are all challenges that we need the parties to come together, particularly the great powers to come together to try to deal with these effectively. And yet the period that we're in makes that exceedingly uh, difficult. If that wasn't challenging enough, and I hope not to be like the start the morning as, as winning the most depressing speaker award, but if that's not challenging enough, we're also in this period of very profound technological disruption. So the technolo technologies that gave the US and others you know, uh, economic advantage, security advantage in the past, those are not the technologies that are going to find um, advantage in the future. So the advent of AI, quantum computing, synthetic bio, these are areas where we need to reinvest to keep our edge um, and to make sure that these technologies develop um, responsibly and safely. Um, so there are many of these issues we could discuss, but we are here in Australia. We are focused on the Indo-Pacific, and so what I'd like to do is really talk about, focus on the future of this region and how do we deal with the, um, the, a more assertive China in particular. So I'm gonna focus on five key areas and I hope that we can get into more detail in the panel discussion and the rest of the day. Number one in my mind, and I confess I come from a defense background, but is its deterrence. Um, we are facing the possibility through either miscalculation or deliberate, po deliberate policy of put it, getting into a situation where we find ourselves in a great power war that would be catastrophic, not only for um, uh, the region, but for the global economy and for the world. This is a war that we absolutely have to prevent. prevent. Um, when you sit in Washington, you hear a lot of people talk about the year 2027. Um, I think it's recognized broadly that you know, Xi's approach to Taiwan, his preferred approach is to uh, use uh, economic and political coercion to shrink Taiwan's space and push it into capitulation, uh, to re sort of acknowledge that it, it is part of one China and to basically uh, give up its, um, its current standing. But I think there's also some indication that she isn't going to wait forever. He's been very public and consistent in stating he wants to resolve the Taiwan issue on his watch. He's also ordered his military to be ready with options for him by 2027. So I'm not predicting 2027, but I think 2027 is the date by which we as allies and the broader community in the region need to be ready to be tested. Um, and what does that look like? It means that on any day when she decides, maybe today is the day I'm going to launch a blockade or a quarantine on Taiwan or, or something worse. Um, we have to be able, through a combination of diplomatic, economic, and military means, to convince him that the risk is too high. Either that he will not possibly succeed, he cannot succeed with acceptable risk, or that even if he does, the costs will be so great to, for China that they will be crippling and could actually threaten his rule. That's the challenge of deterrence, and we can talk about what strengthening that really takes. The second key area that I'd like to focus on is strengthening our alignment and collaboration as allies and, and with partners. You know, one of the things that struck me just in the last two days is how uh, strong the US-Australia uh, alliance is, um, because we've had a lot of time to engage with our Japanese partners, how strong the US-Japan alliance is, but what's really the new factor is how strong the trilateral relationship between US and Australia and Japan together is. Um, and I think, you know, really investing in building out our um, diplomatic coalitions, um, not only with those three countries, but with other like-minded states in the, in the region who are facing coercive action from China, Philippines, Vietnam, others, uh, India. Um, you know, when, when we are able to push back collectively 
China tends to pay attention in a way that it doesn't when it's just one of us speaking alone. And so I think really working on aligning our interests, developing ways of pushing back together, I think will be more, more successful. In addition, we have to collect, shore up our collective defense capabilities. Um, AUKUS, in my view, was a strategic masterstroke. It's very important development, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, again, as I mentioned, the trilateral relationship, the deepening of the relationship with Japan and Australia together. The reinvigoration of the Quad, I think, has been very strategic and important. And the posture investments we're making in the region to really not only increase US and allied access across the region, but also to really build serious partner capacity. The third area that I'd like to highlight is really building out a shared toolkit for resisting and rendering ineffective Chinese economic coercion. Um, because of globalization and so many decades of integrating supply chains, markets, et cetera, we really are, there are substantial dependencies and in a crisis, those dependencies can be very serious vulnerabilities. So I think we need to do a lot more work and maybe this is a task for USSC <laughs> and others, um, to do both national and shared assessments of where are those dependencies and vulnerabilities? Where do we essentially provide China with real points of leverage um, in any kind of dispute or crisis? And then how do we invest in reducing those risks, reducing that leverage um, through more diversified, resilient supply chains and other measures where we can collaborate together to support each other and put each other in a stronger position together. So this is an area where if we wait until we have a crisis to be thinking about this, it's too late. We've got to take proactive planning and action now to really understand all of the interactions and put ourselves in a better position. The fourth thing I would highlight is investing in the drivers of our own competitiveness um, and really accelerating uh, innovation, particularly in those key technology areas that I mentioned. This means um, robust science and technology funding, research and development. It means, at least in the US case, immigration policies that welcome the best and brightest from around the world. When you look at Silicon Valley, half of the founders are either immigrants or first generation Americans. We depend <coughs> on that talent, that STEM talent from coming to the US and investing. And I know that um, Australia and, and others do, do as well. This is going to be, there's a particular um, instantiation of this that I think we, we need to make successful and that is pillar two of AUKUS. This is a great opportunity to work together to accelerate not only innovation but innovation adoption, uh, particularly for our, our, our security. Um, lastly and not least, We've all got to continue to try, as frustrating and difficult as it sometimes is, um, to engage China, to help to really engage in dialogue about China, to try to get them to realize that their interest do, does not lie in, in using coercive and aggressive means to solve problems and issues, to try to get them to buy into the kind of risk reduction frameworks that we were you know, remarkably able to put into place even at the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We had an incidence at sea agreement. We had a hotline. We had risk reduction and de-escalation measures. We don't have that with China. The US has been trying very hard. China has sort of not been interested, but I, I don't think we should give up on that, particularly including other areas like space and cyberspace. Um, and then, you know, trying to get China to create space, even when we have a period of strategic competition, to collaborate. The future of the planet depends on us figuring out how to get China to seriously collaborate with us uh, on preventing climate change. So these are some of the issues I think, I hope we'll get into in more detail, um, but we've got our work cut out for us, so <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks very, very much, Michelle. Perfect framing remarks. We'll spend 10, 15 minutes up here uh, in conversation, then I'll invite, invite our distinguished panel up to dive into some of the, the issues you raised. Um, 
uh, we're holding our um, uh, Sydney International Strategy Forum um, in counterpoint to a big forum in, in, in China right now, uh, the Jiangxi Forum, where the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission um, uh, gave a speech just yesterday where he accused a certain country of passing knives to dangerous countries, um, of creating small blocks, of disrupting peace. The vice chairman was too polite to mention New Zealand by name, <laughs> but um, he's obviously talking about the United States of America. And it's a reminder that um, Beijing's narrative is that this is a bipolar competition. It's the U.S. and China. And the subtext is everyone else should mind their own business, which would be a smart uh, play for Beijing because one of our critical advantages is our uh, really historically unprecedented network of allies and partners. But living here for over a year, I can tell you here uh, in, a less, in a lesser way in Japan, uh, certainly in Southeast Asia, there is some anxiety about where the U.S. takes this. Mm -hmm. And you've worked um, the region and allies and partners your entire career. I wanted to ask you first um, about the agency, the influence that uh, an ally like Australia or, or Japan would have. Um, because when you're in Canberra or Tokyo, it's not just about shaping Beijing's behavior, it's also about shaping Washington's. Mm -hmm. So from your experience in watching the real, um, very, very broad consensus in US policy now on the importance of allies and partners, um, how do allies and partners play in this? And how do they shape American strategic policymaking? You know, I think there's a strong bipartisan recognition for the most part, with some extremes that maybe don't recognize this, but the, a core that recognizes that you know we cannot succeed without our allies and partners, and that also understands that you know our allies and partners actually live here, <laughs> and they have a level of insight and experience and you know observation that can be is really valuable to our to US thinking and collective thinking. So I have long encouraged allies not to be polite, <laughs> but to, when they come to Washington, especially if they're strong allies, especially if they're Australia, especially if they're Japan, like we count on you to speak up and say, you know, you're thinking about this all wrong, or you're about to make a terrible mistake, or shouldn't we also be thinking of that and not this? Or do you realize that if you do this, you'll put us in this position that you make our policy better, you make our collective policy better? And I think, you know, in this administration, I think there's a, a, a pretty high degree of openness to that sort of candid, um, you know, constructive dialogue. So the first recommendation from today's conference to our friends from DFAT, Guy Show, Global Affairs Canada, is be rude to the Biden administration. No, <laughs> I didn't say rude. I said candid and constructive. Um, but don't pull your punches. <laughs> how much of that should be public and how much should be private? Oh, I think the more it's private, the more effective it is. It's fair, you know, if you do go public, you know, then you're, you're, you're putting, you know, your counterpart in a defensive posture and making them having to justify themselves. It's counterproductive. But private, I think private conversation is extremely um, helpful. So as the U.S. is doubling down on its allies and, um, and, and partners, you know, strategically aligned partners like India, um, uh, you know, China and Russia are doing the same. Their roster is not as impressive. As ours, North Korea is a great um, North Korea, Iran, um, <laughs> arguably even Hamas, yeah. um, not as impressive. But clearly, Beijing is um, on that path. Um, uh, President Putin's participation in the Belt and Road Forum was striking. What do you make of that? Is it um, does it parallel what we have with U.S. alliances and partnerships? Um, is it um, limiting? Uh, is it symbolic, or do you worry about quite? Um, a substantive defense technology and other cooperation among the, um, uh, the you know, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Yeah, I, I don't think you can compare the relationship between China, Russia, and Iran, for example, and DPRK to the alliance network that we've built over decades since the end of World War II. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't worry about it. Um, I, I think they're particularly on tech transfer, you know, the transfer of Iranian drones to Russia for use in Ukraine, the transfer of, you know, Chinese um, 
uh, parts and components that you know to to both. It, it just um, it is a it is definitely a, um, you know a problematic. I wouldn't call it an alliance. It's a problematic you know partnership. I I do think there are natural tensions and limits, particularly in the Russia China relationship. There's not a, a history of a lot of trust there, and and I also think that Putin's um, you know, pariah status and his blatant and repeated violations of international not law and the atrocities that he's committed in Ukraine has caused Xi to at least publicly kind of keep himself somewhat um, separate. I worry, frankly, um, even more. I worry even more about China. If they're not you know, they're not allies, but China's ability to use its economic statecraft to either take other countries in the global south, you know, off the board uh, in terms of they just won't they won't stand up and, and criticize, they won't push back, um, or even to coerce them into uh, aligning in a more positive way. And so, I think that that's the dynamic I worry about even more than 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 the particular triangle you described. Do we have opportunities um, for wedge strategies? You sometimes here in Washington. It's a minority view, but you sometimes hear, um, particularly on the right now, uh, the view that we shouldn't be hard on Putin over Ukraine because we can try to drive a wedge between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, the Japanese government in the past has pursued a Northern Territories resolution in part with the aim of playing the Russia card against China. Everyone has Nixon uh, and yeah. China and the big geopolitical play in the 70s in mind, but do we have any of those options? And if we don't, how do we manage what is an alignment among states that um, uh, you know want to undermine the order as it is? Some with much higher risk, like Moscow; others in more you know incremental ways, like Beijing. If we can't drive wedge strategies, what do we do, or are there wedge strategies? Yeah, I don't know if there are wedge strategies that are likely to be effective at the strategic level in terms of per permanently dividing these countries, and I don't think we should give Putin a pass in order to focus on Beijing. Um, but I do think in particular areas, there are opportunities to try to reduce or limit their collaboration. And again, the, what's happening in Ukraine and creating, uh, being very clear about the price that China would pay um, in terms of sanctions and other measures if they were to more forcefully support um, Russia's efforts. I think that's an example of one specific issue where we can try to put a, a small wedge in there to, to limit behaviors. But I don't envision us being able to peel off Iran permanently, peel off Russia. Um, or at least I wouldn't be willing to pay the price right. of doing that. Um, you started with deterrence. Um, uh, our polls, other polls show the public's generally understand how important deterrence is right now. That's, that's and how important alliances are. Mm -hmm. That's the good news. The bad news is, and Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in our poll, um, only about a third of the publics were willing to spend more than we currently do in the US, Australia, or Japan to achieve deterrence. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Japan's going to 2% of GDP. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida pledged that, but then he also came out recently and said he wants to do tax cuts. Um, yep. So yep. the pressures of the welfare state right now, um, uh, the something we'll talk about in the afternoon, the, the, the strong public support for industrial policy and public sector investments in the economy. I mean, we have a resourcing problem. Yeah. And we also have a um, military transformation problem. Mm -hmm. um, like you, I think AUKUS is, is transformational, but we have this bathtub, um, which um, uh, the governments are trying to fill while we yeah. actually have that capability come online. Do you have a magic bullet <laughs> for these um, Not a magic bullet, but it's, it's, it's an approach. I mean, I do think we have to do, we in the United States anyway, have to do a better job of making the case to the American people about why we need to sustain robust defense spending in this period of time, given all that we're facing. And I think, you know, if, you know, if, if the rise of China, uh, you know, uh, Xi's China wasn't enough, we have Ukraine now, we have um, uh, Israel and, and Hamas in the heart of the Middle East. Uh, you know, so there, there are some serious national security challenges that we need to invest in and be able to deal with. Um, but beyond that, I don't think it's a matter of throwing more money. Um, uh, it it's not, doesn't necessarily have to 
cost much more than what we projected. It's how you spend the money. And in my view, if particularly in the short term, in a four-year time frame, it, you know, it's not about uh, what we can field in terms of major new platforms in that time frame. It's how do you use the legacy forces you have with some new technologies, and I'll give you a couple of examples, to enable new operational concepts that have a more powerful result in terms of deterring Xi. So, for example, if you think about AI, already the Department of Defense is starting to use AI for what we call predictive intelligence to be able to give commanders and decision makers much more indications of warning by recognizing patterns of behavior and early indicators much earlier um, than was, you know, has been in the past. That's a huge advantage. Number two, what if we could use AI as a, as a smart, kind of switcher and router for our C4R system. If you have a contested part of, you know, it's contested constantly, part of it's going down, part of it's degraded, AI helps you reroute the flow of information matching decisions, sensors, shooters, etc. And then third, human machine teaming. If, you know, we have today smart, expendable drone technology, AI enabled, if you can give one human operator the, you know, the ability to control a hundred, a hundreds, hundreds of drones under sea, on the sea, in the air, um, with some smart operational concepts, you are going to really give the Chinese military a bad day, right? This is not terribly expensive. This is stuff we could be doing now. The department has announced something called the replicator program. It's the right thing to do. It's not clear exactly how they're going to execute it yet, but the notion is to put uh, to get to a much better place in that human machine teaming in the next few years. So it doesn't have to. It, a lot of it is how do we get more creative uh, with new concepts for combining what we have or what's you know nearly in hand, what can be fielded fairly quickly. And how do we get on with that and do that at scale to give our folks in Indopaycom some new tools, some new opportunities to have a better chance to deter? And the interesting thing about AI, when we discussed this in July at Aspen, is it has that opportunity to have um, leapfrogging capabilities for deterrence, but also it provides um, the switching you need to create command and control and C4ISR for variations of allies and partners. Yes, that's right. So a lot of our command and control system looks like it did before the internet was invented, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, the AI opportunity is to actually uh, integrate in ways where countries maintain sovereignty, but the switching station helps um, expedite decision making. Yes. Um, so uh, really um, uh, heavy, heavy uh, inbox for Secretary of Defense Austin yes. <laughs> and his